Pratik, I want you all to also listen to me and the words that are coming out of my mouth because some of the things that I will be saying are not going to be presented on the slideshow because I do sidebars and also I get inspired even by the things that I write. So it becomes an entire almost performative moment of learning that I love sharing with individuals. All right, so going for the critique. What is the critique? What are we doing? All right, so. It is important to roadmap your arguments. Um, and this goes for anything. This goes for if you're reading a dissad, a counterplan, a case neg, topicality. You want to space out and categorize the different pieces of an argument, and in this sense, different pieces of a critique to make sure that, you know, um, there's no confusion. Now, it's kind of cut out in the very bottom, so I'll make sure that. I say what it is that I was saying, but a few things to note about critiques is that not every critique is the same. And so it's important to know the theoretical elements of your argument and what that will require for debate arguments. There is a difference between, wow, you read a book or you read an article and how you are effectively using that within the kind of um activity of debate because debate is not just throw a book at one another and see who read the book the best but who is best able to use that in debate to be competitive and it's very important that we remember this because sometimes we can get so bogged down by just you know oh there's so much that i have to know and so much information that i have to acquire um and less of the what are the parts of this argument that I need to know in order to advance it in a round competitively? Very, very important distinction because sometimes we can get too deep down the rabbit hole of like just theory and not grounding it in competition. Uh, and a big role of this lecture is going to take you from the one and C down to the two and R. And so when we're mapping out um, the kind of portions are different two and R's. It's important that you prep uh, this way for not only the season and for tournaments, um, and that this will force you to break down the moving parts of your argument and to know the things you have to win and the things you can lose. Uh, because, you know, not every debate that you have, there are going to be parts of your argument that you are losing, and that is actually okay because you have mapped out your arguments to find out what are parts of the argument that I don't have to win and even can lose and still win the greater debate. And so it's a lot better to map those things out before the round than to find yourself in the round and be like, I'm losing this argument, how can I pivot? It's much better to think about that before the round even starts and it saves you so much thinking time during the debate so that you stay focused and zeroed in. Um, but also it just shows how much you've thought about your argument and how to apply it in debate. And it makes the two and R just so much more easier because it's a hard speech to give because you have so many things to figure out which one thing you want to go for. So there are five different components of the critique and this is where I'm gonna sidebar off just a little bit to describe and explain these a little bit more in detail. And the first is the overview. Uh, the second is the theory of power, if this is applicable for your uh, critique. And there's levels to it. There's levels of theory um, that are part of um, the critique that you would choose to read, depending on the scholarship. The next is framework. Um, as a critique, you generally, rule of thumb, will have to have a framework argument because you are reading something less about the implementation about the plan of the plan and more about the kind of scholarly foundations that the affirmative resides on. Next is links and permutations. I put links slash perm as in link arguments are what you are saying the plan has done that is bad or what scholastically does the plan rely on that is bad? And those link arguments would be then answers to a permutation. And a permutation is what every 2AC should have in response to a, a critique. Um, and the role of the permutation is to, to um, show non-mutual exclusivity. And what that means is that there 
is no reason why you cannot do the affirmative and the negative at the same time or that the method of the affirmative is consistent or is necessary in order to solve for the critique. Lastly, and important is the alternative. What is the method of the critique? The critique has spent all this time telling the affirmative what it has done that is wrong um, and why we should understand debate through the lens of insert whatever theory, and in this case, settler colonialism. The question then becomes, then what does the critique do? What is that method? What does debate look like when we endorse the negative? And the alternative is that response. The alternative is what is the mechanism or the method that the critique would defend as being a better way to solve for the links. And we're gonna get into why I said solve for the links and not solve for the affirmative in uh, the part where we talk about the alt. Part about the overview, this is an important part. It is the part where you're telling your story. You're telling the critique story. Um, you should assume that the judge has no idea about the theory of the world that you are presenting in the debate. This can be the cap K, this can be anti-blackness, this can be settler colonialism, this can be queer theory, this can be, you know, a discussion of biopower, this can be a discussion of abolition. Um, that you have a theory um, that grounds the critique and you need to apply it to not only the affirmative, but to debate. So this should not be too convoluted, too messy, too confusing, um, especially if you're uh, tackling the theory debate. And so sometimes folks will separate the overview from a explanation of what is the theory, why is that theory true, or why should you prefer believing this theory over the theory of the affirmative? Um, and so you can pick and choose depending on how you're writing your overview. So when you say that settler colonialism is true and is the way in which the world operates and should affect how the judge evaluates the debate, the answer or the question that you have to respond to is why, right? Why is that true? What are, what are, what are, what is the basis? for that. And that's the theory portion. The overview portion is how are you applying that to debate? Does that make sense, Nariel? The difference between why is the theory true versus the overview being how are you applying it to how to the debate and what that then means for how we evaluate the round? Wait, so what, okay, can you clarify what theory, like what theory debate is again? Like, yeah, is so, it, is it I'm like gonna get, I'm gonna get into that to be honest in the next slide, but right now it's just the distinction. Do you understand the distinction between what I'm saying? Between like the overview proper and the theory debate being a subset of that, right? Mm -hmm. So this is when I said that you want to make sure that you're not just reading a book in front of the judge, right? Here is settler colonialism. Here are all the things that it describes and explains. Here is why it is right. That is not you presenting an overview to the judge. That is you just explaining the theory, right? Mm -hmm. The overview tells the judge what this debate should be about and how to evaluate both the affirmative and the criticism and what is the big impact in the round. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the goal of the overview should be to ground the thesis of your argument through a comparative calculus of the affirmative's impacts, risk calculus, internal link chain. Um, and what that means is how does the ask deductive reasoning uh, premised on something the K is critiquing. So like, uh, in the specifics of this affirmative, which is abolish ICE, the criticism, the, the settler colonial 
critique could question um, the affirmative commitment to sovereignty or the affirmative commitment to liberalism, right? Like, is liberalism a good thing or a bad thing? That settler colonialism critique would have something to say um, about that. And the same thing about sovereignty. It would have something to say about whether or not that is a good or bad thing. Generally, it would say that those are bad things and that the affirmative invests in them. And so therefore, the affirmative is either just uh, doomed to fail and therefore um, we should not vote for failure or um, is bad and we should not vote for things that make the system worse. Uh, so yeah, does the, another kind of line of questioning is does the K turn the F's impact? Uh, so let's say the affirmative in this packet says that racism is um, bad or like systematic racism is bad. The critique could turn the F's impact, not saying systematic racism good, no one should ever be saying that, but rather saying that the affirmative causes for those impacts to um, happen at an even worse scale. Because if the critique is true uh, about how they have understood power and how systems work and how uh, bodies um, are organized and why the affirmative does not change that organization or does not change that very negative use of power. It means that that power stays in place, that same power that creates violence in the status quo. And so the affirmative by default, right, replicates that same violence. So while the affirmative would say they solve for white supremacy or solve for systematic racism, the critique would say you actually cause further instances by buying into a system, right, that is indubitably parasitic because of its settler colonial foundations. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah, and so those are some things that you would think about in the overview um, because you want to make sure that you are telling the judge how they should be evaluating the debate. So how much time would you say that we spend on the overview? Um, it really depends on how theory dependent your criticism is, right? So if you were, if, um, the argument requires a lot, there's a lot of moving parts, right? Um, where there's a lot of stuff that is part of the kind of claim of settler colonialism, which there is. Um, you would spend more time, than, for example, the capitalism critique. There's not much that needs to be explained for why the world is capitalist and why capitalism can lead to exploitation um, and why that is the biggest impact in the debate, right? Not much explanation has to go towards that because that is pretty common knowledge, you know, um, and no one is going to refute that the, you know, United States is capitalist, mm -hmm. right? No one's going to refute that. But when you say settler colonial, people go, okay, so what does that mean? Or how does that get applied? Or where and how? And so that's where you have to start explaining more because of uh, folks' uh, lack of understanding, but also lack of ability to connect the dots. You have to help them connect the dots. Okay. Uh, so I would say it really depends, but like probably more than a minute probably more than a minute. I would probably put this at two minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry. Next is the theory debate. Um, this is both the most underutilized and overutilized portion of the debate. Um, I say under um, because a lot of times the theory portion doesn't end up saying a lot of substantive things. Like you talked a lot, but you didn't say a lot. Um, 
to help aid your argument. And over, because this portion of the debate ends up having a robust word economy, right? So this is the whole, you said a lot, but a lot of it can't even like, there's no, there's not been enough to kind of use, right? You just kind of did a lot of buzzwords. You explained a lot of things, but what was the utility of what you said? And that's something that we need to be very careful of to make sure that we are being efficient with our words. Um, the theory debate can be embedded in your overview as the top layer of thesis, right, of your own criticism before you start the comparative analysis of where you are weighing the K against the F, or it can go after depending on the density of your theory element and how much time the affirmative has spent in responding to the thesis of the critique. This is where, and we, there might be some portions of this that are in the bottle evidence packet, some parts that are not, just because I didn't want to overcomplicate the packet. Um, but the affirmative might say that ontology arguments are too totalizing. They determine the world too far. The world is too complex for one theory to be able to describe and explain every instance. Uh, and contingency goods that we should lean towards those complexities or that psychoanalysis is non-falsifiable. That's less of this critique. There really isn't really a psychoanalytic claim that is being made. So these are just more examples. They are all things that are present um, in the file. But the one that definitely is, is like ontology to totalizing that one theory cannot describe or explain um, every single instance of the plan or every single instance of the world. Uh, but does that answer your, some of your question about the theory debate? Um, yeah. Okay. So framework. So huh, what is framework and why do you need to have it in the 2NC? Not the 1NC, the 2NC. Need everyone to listen to me. The framework debate for the negative starts in the 2NC. Uh, technically, it starts in the one and C, but that's just the critique. You have set up a you know an argument that has a framework element, but that you're not deploying it until the affirmative reads their framework arg. Um, but not every K is as framework dependent as others. For example, the cap K won't be as intense on framework as anti-blackness or a postmodernism critique. Um, that is because the cap K is materially closer to the affirmative than more ontological and post-structural criticisms. And if you're listening to me going, all right, you have said ontological, you have said post-structural, and so therefore you have lost me. Let me take a sip. That's totally fair. Don't worry about it. All I am saying is that there are different levels of criticisms. And for this critique in particular, uh, already embedded a framework argument for the 2NC, you need to read framework in these debates for the AF and the negative. I put it in the file, read it. This is me describing once it's in the debate. So the purpose of framework is to lower the link threshold. Let me explain what that means. You read the critique in the what and see. Then the affirmative gets up in cross sex and says, all right, this sounds like a link to the world, not necessarily anything that the affirmative um, has done that has made anything necessarily worse. Framework is to help answer that question to be like, okay, we don't necessarily have to win. It's what the plan uh, on an implementation level does, i.e. the plan passing and what it does, but rather it's about the kind of assumptions of the world that the affirmative kind of invests in that affect how we understand implementation. Do you see how that's different than a critique to, okay, the affirmative abolishes ICE, abolishing ICE is bad because of, it's less of that and more so the way in which the affirmative understands abolition or the 
way in which the affirmative understands immigration or the way in which the affirmative understands reform is bad. Do you see how those are kind of two different, uh, two different like link um, explanations? One is what the plan did that's bad and how the plan does it is bad. You feel me? Does that make sense? Yes, kind of. What's the question? Like, I don't really know how to phrase this. I just know that I'm going to end up getting like tri uh, tripped up over framework and just like, like, how, how do you like really, especially like for the AF side, like, what what would you say in like responses like them saying oh that your mindset is inherently like pushing these assumptions or like you you assume these things which are bad because like the app is like solely based on policy right mm -hmm. so like how and like how like how would you respond to that on the app side because seeing as like, especially like with the pack, it's like all most of the affirmatives are gonna be like policy based. The U.S. government should, and I'm assuming that most cases are attacking like the U.S. government being a bad thing, one way or another. Okay, well, so I'm I'm maybe confused at your question. What are you asking like in terms of? the AF's response to the critique or the negative's response to the AF? I'm the AF's response to the critique, yeah. Well, that's a different lecture. Okay. That's the answer in the critique, which is happening next, next week. It's okay. like my first answer. Because uh, like that's, there's different ways to respond to the K. And so I'm more focused on how to go for the criticism, right? Mm -hmm. Then answering it right now okay but like that will be a lecture but and also everything has a rejoinder so like if the negative is extending framework then the affirmative would extend a framework argument right well the affirmative is actually the first speech to extend a framework argument explicitly and that's in your packet right like mm -hmm. you can see there's a 2ac2 for framework that is to read that in the 2ac in response to the criticism mm -hmm. so like it's a debate as to what does the affirmative get to have, right? What does the affirm what does the debate have to get to be about? And if the affirmative wins framework, then it's going to be harder for the negative to win um, that link threshold, right? It, it being a question less of how does what the plan does bad versus how does the kind of foundations that the plan resides on are bad. If the negative wins, they get to have the debate more so about the foundations that the AF solves. Oh. Uh, but if the affirmative wins, it's more about, you know, what the plan does. And then therefore the negative has to have a higher link threshold to kind of jump to, to create their link story to apply more so to implementation. So whoever wins the framework debate, right, kind of controls how much of a link argument the negative has to win. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's what I mean by like the link threshold that exists on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and so the other part purpose of framework is to hold the app accountable uh, to the interpretation. So the affirmative will have an interpretation, the negative will have a counter interpretation you will have to explain why your counter interpretation is the best for debate. And so sometimes that looks like um, only your counter interpretation gets the affirmative or forces the affirmative to have to defend those foundations, right? Rather than just focusing on oh implementation because if you win that those foundations one um are super super important uh for kind of the scholarship of debate but also two um if not 
uh, considered first exclude a very important conversation that the affirmative would have to win as possible under their interpretation, which you would say they will not win because it only can be when we do not focus on the implementation level of the plan and more so the scholarly implications or foundations of the plan. You with me? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so that's the whole, the affirmative accountable to the counter interpretation and explain why the F interpretation is bad. Um, and so then you want to implicate fiat. Uh, we talked about fiat a little bit in the um, case or being F as well as being negative lecture as well as at the workshop. Um, but I will do some more kind of words here now about that. So uh, fiat is uh, a kind of method that, or not a method, but it is a tool in the affirmative kit that allows for the debate to be less about if the plan passes, but should the plan pass. And so we don't have debates over, you know, whether or not the affirmative would happen, um, because that would kind of drastically change how debate operates, right? Um, but more so, the plan does happen does the plan happening a good or bad thing? Now, here is where the critique challenges that. And it's like, well, no, the affirmative should not get fiat. The affirmative should not just get to be like, oh, the plan happens. So all we should focus on is does abolish ICE, you know, solve for um, institutional racism, right? Or does it solve for progressive uh, treatment of immigrants, right? Does it do that? The critique is like, no, we should not, like they, the affirmative should not get to weigh its impacts versus the critique because we're, we are critiquing the very kind of um, understanding that the affirmative has about solvency, right? how the affirmative solves, how the affirmative thinks about reform, how the affirmative thinks about immigration. If we win the how the affirmative thinks through those things are bad, it should not actually matter whether or not abolishing ICE is a good or bad thing because we will win that the investment in the way in which the affirmative came to the conclusion of abolishing ICE was settler colonial, bad and most likely will only reproduce the same issues that are consistent within white supremacy and institutional racism. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like, F is like, wand, we get abolish ICE, therefore we get impact. Negative should have to win why abolish ICE doesn't do that. Neg is like, no, that is not what the debate should be about because it means that the affirmative will always just be a debate about the impact, i.e. F solves institutional racism and less about how does the affirmative set itself up to understand the law, understand its relationship to institutions and understand itself in relationship to settler colonialism. We don't get to have those kind of second level, third level, fourth level testings of scholarship because the app is just like, well, we solve for our impact. So like, that's it, right? And the critique's like, no, that's like not a educational um, debate to be had. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Excellent, I'm glad. Um, so the next part is that you wanna create a clear directive to the judge. Um, and this can be the role of the ballot, uh, which will be potentially helpful if you end up deciding to not go for um, alternative solvency. So we'll, we will have a kind of more practices and conversations um, about, you know, the critique and strategy. This is just to get your mouth wet and to get an idea of what's going on here. So at the end of this lecture, you're like, I still have so many questions that's okay. I am someone who's been in this for 10 years almost, and I still have questions. I still need to stop and think about, you know, what is happening or what are the things the negative ha or the negative either has to win or the affirmative has to win. And so if I'm 10 years into this having these questions and you're not 10 years into this having these questions, 
It just shows that we're constantly learning and thinking about the strategy of debate. So do not feel bad if you do not have the complete strategy under your grasp um, after this. I would actually be disbelieving if you did. So, oops. Um, so yeah, the role of the ballot is just more so, what is this debate about? What can this debate resolve? What should this debate resolve? Is it a question of ICE being abolished, yes or no? Or rather, is it more so about challenging settler colonialism or, or challenging settler colonial you know, investments in scholarship or settler colonial investments in the world? Because if that is the role of the ballot, it means that it's less about whether or not the affirmative solves for um, ICE, right, but more so about whether or not the way in which the affirmative solves is something that is an investment in settler colonialism, which means that it doesn't matter if the affirmative gets rid of ICE, yes, no, but more so of the way in which it thinks that that is a good or bad thing should be evaluated more because what's to say, right, that when we abolish ICE, that had we created a more radical orientation or relationship to black and brown folks that are not documented? Probably not, right? But uh, ICE is abolished. What is more valuable? Having a conversation where a law has kind of um, gotten rid of some of that institutional harm or challenging the very foundation that puts that institution in place? Has the affirmative met that burden and does the critique set up a more productive conversation for that challenge, which is why we should vote negative? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so that's what the what is what is the ballot? What does it do? What is it? What is the goal and role of it? Because that affects how I understand the alternative and solvency. Like, does the alternative have to solve for institutional racism, or does the alternative? just have to be a better framework argument, right? About just like, we think the kind of scholarship that we've introduced in the debate is net good and better than the affirmative and that you should vote for the scholarship of the critique or of the negative because that means that if we win that scholarship, that the affirmative scholarship is bad. If we win our scholarship and that it is mutually exclusive, i.e. not the same and therefore cannot happen at the same time as the affirmative, you would have to choose the negative um, scholarly um, investigation first. Yeah? Yeah. Perfect. Um, and so make sure that you don't ignore the standards debate. This is where we start talking about education, fairness, clash, portable skills, all of that stuff. And we'll develop more words to this as we develop the season, but um, this is an area where you can throw in additional framework link arguments. Like you can have like a reformism link kind of implicitly put into the standards debate if you didn't want to make it like a larger link argument. But um, to speak to the standards debate, you would say that your counter interpretation is the best for fairness, right? That um, the affirmative would say that if the if they don't get to weigh the affirmative, like the full app implementation and all, that they lose a large portion of the 1AC. Your argument would be that no, you don't actually, and that either A, fairness is arbitrary, um, and therefore there's not one way to, to like objectively, um, what is it, objectively measure it, uh, or B, that the interpretation of the negative is more fair or fair enough that the affirmative has to be able to defend their um, kind of scholarly, epistemological, and epistemological just purely means it's the study of thinking, right? Like what are the kind of, um, I, I want to move out of saying scholarly, but what are the kind of ways in which the affirmative asks the judge uh, and the participants to think? And is that thinking a good one? Is that a bad thinking model or is it a good thinking model, right? If that is something that is fair and what the affirmative is necessarily always already doing and that they should defend it, then it just being something that 
it doesn't matter as much. You would say that epistemology, right, the way in which we come into learning and how we think about um, how we think is very, very important and is the reason why, you know, it's important to think about settler colonialism and how that affects the way in which we navigate and orient ourselves in the world. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, so yeah, that's an example of all the things that are part of the framework debate and what the negative should be doing. Next is links. So <clears throat> there are theory links versus functional links. And let me take another sip of my this. Whoo, energy. All right, sorry y'all. I just need a little sip because it is at halfway part of the day. So links, you need to have them. You need them. You don't got a link. You don't have a reason for why the plan is bad. Um, but there are theory links and then there are functional links. Knowing which will be helpful for putting together um, your different negative strategies. So like knowing kind of, are you going the more theory route or are you going the more functional route? And I'll break the down uh, what I mean by theory and what I mean by functional. So the first, theory links. They will rely heavily on your ability to win the framework debate um, and should be distinct from the overview theory work. This is why being concise and cutting out the fluff is essential because you spend more time establishing your link arguments and you um, get away from saying a lot of the same things, right? So let's say you do this large explanation for why kind of um, the world is settler colonial and that the way in which this impacts the law is reformist or always trying to kind of update or refine systems but never challenging and changing them, a lot of that can become your reformism link arg. And so if you spend a lot of your time in the overview explaining why the world, uh, because the world is settler colonialism or settler colonial and therefore you understand how institutions operating um, as a kind of endless loop of bad policies or settler colonial policies, and you spend so much time there, by the time that you get to the link debate and you're just describing like a reform is bad because it only tries to update or to, you know, correct the system rather than challenge or break it down, it sounds very similar to your overview. And so making sure that your overview is focused in on what is this debate about, what does it come down to, and you evaluate the affirmative and the impacts, it allows for you to have a distinct difference between the link debate, especially with our theory links, right, and the overview, especially if it is densely theory written. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so examples of this, uh, like I said earlier, it would be like a sovereignty link, right? Or um, a reformism link. And the reformism link honestly could probably exist in both the functional and theory level, depending on how you're deploying the argument. Like, for example, if you were to just say that abolish ICE is not an, a, it's not an abolition, it is a reform, and that reforms don't, like reforms are bad because they justify the continuation of the system, you have made more of a, a functional argument than a theoretical argument because you are critiquing implementation. You are saying that by abolishing ICE, that is more so a reform that allows for, you know, this idea of, you know, correct, oop, sorry, of, it, it just affirms the idea that reforms can be good. And so you're saying that abolish ICE is actually not abolition, it is a reform, which means that it does not challenge the larger system. And that by investing in abolish ICE, it only allows for continual bad cherry picking reforms to continue. You see how that's functional? Like that is what the plan does and what you would argue it would lead to more bad reforms. Does that make sense? How that would be functional? Yeah. 
And then the theory elements, if I were to take sovereignty, for example, right? It's like sovereignty is really bad because of the ways in which it places bodies and how it imbues value into those particular um, bodies through a kind of conquest of genocide and captivity. We were, we're kind of describing kind of the way in which institutions are organized, the ways in which bodies are organized, and why that kind of theory argument, like the F, would say that they should invest in you know, making institutions better, right? So like in very many ways, the F defends sovereignty. So you have an argument just for why totalizing, right? Sovereignty is bad. And because the affirmative defends sovereignty on some level, right? Regardless of whether or not they reduce it because ICE is bad, we should get rid of ICE, even though it's a reform, it's a reform that we should take on. Your argument is that that doesn't really matter in a world where um sovereignty writ large uses moments like the affirmative to justify the continuation of itself right mm -hmm. like how sovereignty uses things as such as the emancipation proclamation right slaves are now free or black folks are now freed but did that mean that the system writ large changed or that the way in which we viewed and evaluated black folks changed no no Right, but it's like we needed to, you know, emancipate um, slaves because that was the objectively moral standing thing to do. Your argument would be, but sovereignty in and of itself is the reason why it uses those moments to justify the continuation of it. And your larger argument would be that these things need to be abolished completely, and that the plan is not that abolition; it is a reform. Okay. You with me? It's so like that would be the theory link because you're just critiquing sovereignty writ large. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, yeah, so that's the theory links versus the functional links. Now we're going to get into the permutation. Um, this is how the negative responds to the permutation and less of like what the permutation is or like why the affirmative, uh, what are different tricks with that because that'll be in next week's um, lecture, but I can speak to some of it right now, is that a permutation is a test of competition. Um, a way that it's introduced in debate is when we talk about like the movies, right? Like someone were to give you $20 and you are going to the concession stand. Popcorn is $15, right? And um, the slushy is 10. Can you get them both? Wait, hold up a sec. Do you want to say it again? Yeah. So, movie, the movies example. You've been given $20 to go to the movies. Mm -hmm. You want a concession stand. Popcorn is 15, a slushy is 10. Can you get both? No. Why? Because both of them together is too, it is over your budget. You don't have enough money, right? So you have to choose. Is it the popcorn <laughs> or is it the slushy? Okay. Which one matter, which option is more favorable, right? Some would say the popcorn because I'm, you're hungry and you want a snack and maybe the popcorn will last longer, right? Um, and some would say the slushy because you're hot and you want, you know, a cool drink and you're not that hungry and really you like the fizzy kind of sweet taste of the slushy that the popcorn can never do, right? So like first is that it happens because if you had $30, this wouldn't even matter, right? About whether or not the slushy is better than the popcorn because you have enough money to have both. But because there is an opportunity cost, i.e. that there is a limited amount of resources that means you cannot have both options and you have to make a decision based upon that mutual exclusivity, right? For which option is best. Okay. Right, because if everything could just be done, but if there was no opportunity cost, there would not be a reason for competition, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so the, 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 the permutation debate 
asks the question of, is the critique mutually exclusive with the plan, i.e., is, um, is it true that you can have the popcorn and the slushy? So let's call the AF the popcorn, or let's call the AF the slushy to critique the popcorn, mm -hmm. right? The AF is making the argument that potentially you can have both and that there's not really a reason for why not, that there's not that $20 limit that the negative is saying does exist. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the debate that's happening here. So just keep that in mind as we kind of talk about the negative responses to this argument. One is that the negative is going to say, no, buddy, these things are mutually exclusive. You cannot have the slushy and the popcorn at the same time. You cannot endorse the alternative and the affirmative at the same time. They are functionally different, right? And there is an opportunity cost that you have to pick one over the other. The next is that all links, right, which are the opportunity cost, because they are the things that the affirmative does that are bad and that are not what the alt are, therefore why they are different. And if you've got a link to a plan, you have an impact to that link. So because the plan does that, it leads to a bad thing, and therefore there is a reason why we don't choose to do the plan, right? Um, Wait, can you, go over, can you go over that second reason again? You kind of lost me. So which part, like the link part? The link part. So. Every link has an impact. Does that part make sense? Yeah. If you don't have an impact to your link argument, you have just said, hey, you're doing a bad thing. Okay, why does that matter? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you were like, hey, you're doing a thing that's bad. Okay. Well, why, why, why does that matter? Different than saying, hey, you're doing that bad thing, and that bad thing is going to result in, you know, no one being able to have nice things anymore oh, okay, that's why that thing is bad, right? That's why every link has to have an impact. It mm -hmm. tells why we care. And so when I say that all links are disads, right, it's that if the alternative does not link to the links, which it shouldn't, right? If the alternative should not also apply to the link arguments that you're reading against the app, right? Does that part, does that sentence make sense of what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So therefore, the alternative, right, is competitive with the plan because the plan links the links. The alternative does not. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so when I say all links are dissets to the permutation, it's like every reason for why the F is bad and there is an impact to each of those reasons are dissets to why also the permutation wouldn't work, right? So these are links to the affirmative those links to the affirmative are dissets to the ability for the affirmative to be like both. Let's do both. It's like well, we have link arguments to the F, which also applies to the affirmative because in order for the affirmative to get the perm, the perm includes the F. And we have links to the F. So those same links are dissets or reasons why the permutation also is bad or also would not solve. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yeah. And so you want to make sure that you say that, that all links are disads to the permutation. Um, but also that uh, these links uh, function as disads to different types of perms. Now, the affirmative will go on a laundry list of permutations. They will say, like, permutation do both, permutation do the affin, the alternative, permutation do, um, but what was it permutation do all mutually uh, all non mutually exclusive parts um, of the alternative, right? Which essentially just means permutation do both. Um, but like they like just kind of do a laundry list of permutations um, that either mean that they don't think or buy that the alternative and the affirmative are that different. B, that the affirmative solves for something that the alternative uh, does not and therefore justifies why the permutation should be um, favored. Because if there's not, if the, if, if the critique is light on the link debate, i.e. that um, the alternative, or not, not even link debate, if the, alter, if the critique is light on responding to whether or not the affirmative gets their impact, 
this impact exists in the round. And so the affirmative is going to be like, well, we have this impact, the critique can't solve it. So like in the end, we should still resolve this because if they are even right about the link argument, it doesn't matter if that link argument does not mean the affirmative doesn't solve our impact. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so they will use that as a justification for the permutation because it's like that impact is so big and matters so much that we would need to, let's say, solve for nuclear war before doing or solving for settler colonialism because in a world of nuclear war and extinction, there is no way to combat settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's an example of like a permutation, like permutation solve for the uncontested impact in order uh, to live to see another day to do the critique, but that the critique can't do itself if there's extinction. Okay. Does that make yeah. sense? So that's like an example. Another could be like cross sex is happening and the affirmative keeps on asking the negative. All right, so like, what is the alternative? Like you have these link arguments. What is the alt? The alternative could start describing itself kind of materially, right? Like it could be this insurgent politics. The affirmative goes, well, why is the, why would, and this is going to be the debate that happens, right? Is why is abolish ICE not an insurgent politics? Or why could it not aid in a movement towards, you know, larger um, decarceralization, right? And like, that debate will keep on going back and forth and cross X. Um, and so that's how the affirmative is trying to be like, well, if the F can help those movements, or if the F can be characterized as an insurgent movement because of how the negative is describing it, right? Why is that not just, like, that's a justification for why the plan is consistent with the alternative, right? That, that's, the, that's the F trying to mitigate the difference between the two. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Um, the negative response to that is the framework argument, the theory argument, and then explaining why those mean that it's not about necessarily, you know, um, the material app of the material application of the plan. Oh, there we go. Another person. Hello. We are talking about critiques, um, but. It's not about, it's, it's less about the material kind of what does the alternative do, or even if it is about, here's an example of what the alternative does. The alternative is doing this under a different kind of um, orientation to the world, right? That the affirmative would be doing this investing in sovereignty, i.e. the link arguments would still be true that the negative has placed onto the affirmative. And so, the, you would say that the way in which the affirmative is solving or the method is solving is consistent or is competitive at the level of the link debate because these insurgents politics don't require or invest first in like abolishing ICE, right? Or invest in like appealing to the government, which is where the affirmative starts. Um, and so like it's kind of parsing out the different parts of the debate for why you should not just view like what the alternative is, right? But rather why the alternative is set up in the way it is in combination with the framework and link debate. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, also there's a world in which the alternative doesn't defend like, like one way of doing the plan. It's like the alternative will give examples, right? But rather the alternative really merely exists to show what is compliance versus non-compliance, right? Like what is operating within decorum and what is not? The alternative would say that the affirmative is operating in that decorum, but that the alternative is saying that those things are bad and we shouldn't do that. And so it just gives examples of why what the alternative is critiquing is the app and why we should not do that and why it leads to bad things. You with okay. me? So that's less of like the alt solves and more the alt solves its analysis, right? The alt is right about why this is how the affirmative would understand itself or how the affirmative would happen and why we should not do that. So that's like alt solvency, not that the alt actually does something to solve for the AF. And this is what I had wrote earlier on in the presentation is that alternatives don't have to actually solve the AF at all. The alternative just has to solve the
the links, i.e., it, it the alternative can't link to the same links the app links to. Okay. Yeah. Because if it doesn't link, and you win that link is one, you win the link and the impact of that link, the app leads to worse things, and the alt doesn't do that, and that should be very cut and dry how you vote for the debate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's perm. The answer to perms. Alternatives. More bars from Jasmine. Um, so some have, and I was just doing some of this kind of description now, is that some have solvency and some are an affirmation of your framework argument, right? Why focusing in on settler colonialism at the kind of foundational basis is so important to challenging the way in which we learn, challenging the way in which we invest into sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like the affirmative would be that investment that is bad. The negative would be not that investment, which is good. Um, if you are going for alt solves the links, make sure that you have a robust defense of the lower threshold argument from framework, right? Um, from the framework debate, as well as explain what that means the alternative has to solve for. So like if your link argument is to like why reformism is bad, right? And why it replicates the worst parts of the system, but kind of immorating it or uh, making the world seem more ethical when it's not. So it makes it harder to resist because we think that we're in a better position when we're not, because we're like, we got rid of the bad thing. Why are bad things still happening? Um, that, uh, you would need to contextualize this by saying that we have said reform is bad because of the specific application to the critique. So like, why does settler colonialism say reform isn't bad? How are you timed that? What are your examples, right? That means that the, it's less, that, that means that uh, the alternative at that role for what it solves for would not understand um, reform or refuses the idea of reform. So you see how the link was reform and AF is reform. Alternative solves for the link by saying that we should reject, you know, um, the appeasement that comes from reformism, right? So like if you win that reformism is bad and that the alternative is a rejection of reform, You, you feel me? You see how that's alt solvency? Because mm -hmm. the alt solves for reform being bad by not doing the reform. Oh, okay. Wait, okay. So when the AF like asks you, how are you physically, like, do you have to physically do something? Or like, is it just a different analysis of how you go about reform? reform or like the AFS plan? So my answer is that it can go in different directions. So like it depends on how you're going for the alternative, right? Are you going for an alternative that's trying to solve, you know, for an impact that's the affirmatives? Are you going for an alternative that is really just trying to be the framework debate. Are you going for an alternative? That's just really trying to resolve a link argument, right? Mm -hmm. um, that all de that all determines how you are responding to that question. So, like when somebody asks me, like, okay, so um, what does the alt do? Um, my kind of orientation is that that's the wrong question. It's not about what the alternative does at the level of resolving the ass impact. We have inserted that the world is settler colonialism, uh, is settler colonial, and that we should not prioritize investments in sovereignty, and the alternative is in line with that critique. Uh, if we win a link argument to the plan as to one, why you are that kind of investment and that investment is bad and means that you replicate your impacts or it means that you don't solve and the alternative is distinct, we think that that is the sufficient role of the negative to prove why the F is bad. Uh, or you want to go the alt solves route 
and be like, yeah, we have said that reform is bad. The alternative refuses reform in favor of an insurgent politics, right? Like that's the burnt down business, right? We think that if we win, that the affirmative is a reform and that rather we should prioritize these more kind of insurgent practices that do not require, you know, an institutional focus and that that is a better starting point to the debate, then you can vote negative. Okay. Do you see how those are two different answers? Yeah. Um, da, 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 da. So if you're going for the alt is an affirmation of framework. Um, your framework debate has to be fuego. So like, don't think that, okay, I got it. I'm not gonna have to go for an alternative that does anything. I'm gonna just go for the all its framework. You gotta have a framework debate, right? You gotta explain why it's so important that we have discussions centered around scholarship and why they do, they, 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 that cannot happen in the world of the affirmative right, in the world of the affirmative interpretation. Why focusing at the, on the, the level of the plan text, i.e. the plan does something, that's great. And so like, boom, that's it. That's all we're gonna focus on is them solving for an impact. Why is focusing the debate like that bad? Right, like why does that mean that we do not get to that third level, second level, fourth level testing and understanding of the foundations of the affirmative. You have to win that mutual exclusivity. If you cannot win that, you are not going to win the framework debate. So you first want to win that mutual exclusivity as to why it is important that we start where the affirmative has started or, or you want to at least win why your interpretation, right, is the best um, for both sides. Right, so like your counter interpretation is the best to evaluate the e efficacy uh, or value of the affirmative, and that's better than how the affirmative wants the debate to be about for how we find value or the goodness or badness of the 1AC. Right, so like if the role, for example, if like one of the standards that the affirmative extends is clash. Right, like we want to be able to like have very nuanced and detailed, you know, debates centered around, you know, implementation of the plan or as to whether or not resolving ICE is a good or bad thing. Your argument would be that you don't solve for clash because you don't do that second level, third level testing of the foundations for the affirmative. So like the clash that you're having is not good or is insufficient and it's made better through that kind of baseline, um, kind of foundation slash scholarship debate that the critique enters in the round and resolves the affirmative standards on framework, right? The affirmative will of course have some things to say in response to that, but you want to be able to win that debate because if you don't win the framework debate for why those discussions are key, why it proves why, you know, their use of fiat is bad, or why, you know, you're just correct about kind of applications um, to, um, let me see. Yeah, it just is about like the way in which you frame and apply that stuff. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay, are we feeling like we've learned some things about thinking through the critique as we kind of move through this lecture? I wanna make sure that that is what's happening. Yeah, I think I have a better understanding of like, what am I supposed to do on the negative? <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's why these practices and why these lectures are posted both in the student drive and on YouTube. So please utilize these resources. Ooh the second to last slide and then we're done. And then we're done and then we're done. Whoo, the two in R. You do not want to be the two in that is the following. Judge, I want to win everything. I want to go for everything. I'm right about everything. 
<laughs> I'm just gonna go down the floor and hopefully you find some of nobody. That's not what you wanna do. Cause if you do it, you're gonna find yourself in a lot of frustrating positions. Um, less is more, less is more, less is more. Less is what? More? Yes, less is more. Um, assuming that you stuck to the roadmap for one of the three and R or one of the, the three two and R's that you prep for. So before you go into the debate, that's the first thing that I said at the beginning of this lecture is that you want to come into this with the, what are three different two and R's that I can go for, right? How are they different? So is it an alternative where I'm going for more framework or is it the debate where I'm going for the alt solve the link? Like what is the, th what is the two and R's where I'm just going for an impact turn? right you know like what is happening what is the three two and r's and what do i need to win or what has to happen in those debates for me to get to one of these three options right it makes the bit so much clearer and easier in terms of preps that you're not confused and getting lost in the debate because you're like oh my gosh they said this now what it's like you should have already thought about those different routes right so that you can fit it into whatever model is working best or meets the kind of form that you went into. Of course, new things happen. And sometimes it's going to mess with the three, the three two and R's that you mapped out. That's fine. Try to adapt. And if you're unable to adapt in that route, take those copious notes and all right, now you know what the two and R should have been once you get the judge feedback and are able to think through more of that debate. That's kind of like the, the science um of all of this okay um huh sorry y'all okay and so then here are the things that i want to say one is that setting up even if statements at the top of your speech revealing to the judge what you have to win and hopefully are um, winning uh, and what you can what you can lose so that you don't get bogged down by the several moving pieces for the critique. Be open and honest with your judge, right? Even if the affirmative wins X, we still, if we win this, that doesn't matter or we still win the debate. You will not win every single part of the flow. It is literally, um, impossible. Won't happen. Not gonna take place. Don't think about it. It's not going down. Um, but instead, you should create those even if statements because you understand what is your best offense and what are areas that you don't have to win in order to go for that particular two in our strategy, right? It's important when we have very specific strategies that we want to go for and we think about what is the affirmative going to say and how does either A, that matter or B, it does it and how can I move around it so that I can still go for this argument, right? That's why pre-round prep is so important. Um, two is that your best offense should be on top. I should not hear the main argument that you think that you are winning at the bottom of your, at the bottom of the flow. Nobody, no, 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 no. Buddy, don't do it, don't do it, please. Do not do it. Um, so you want your best offense on top. What is the impact, what is the link and impact you are winning? Why do you win the debate? What is the affirmative fail to respond to? Or what is the affirmative light and responding to for why you're going for this big argument at the top that should always be at the top of your speech? If it is not, oh my friends, it will not go too well because then your speech is going to be kind of lopsided and the judge is going to be like, so what matters in this debate? You want that at the top. Um, uh, da, da, da. Um, and you want that, to, you want to weigh it against also what you think is the 2AR's best path to victory. You know, spade as a spade, you want your top argument and you want to put what you think is going to be their top strategy to that and you want to diminish it a lot you know like, and it doesn't matter if they win their best route to victory that is a judge's favorite thing to hear because we're like oh all right you have told me what this debate comes down to you told me what the affirmative best route to victory is and you look me in the face and said it doesn't matter so if the affirmative gets up and 
goes for that best strategy, I'm already thinking about what the negative said. About, that's exactly what they're going to do. And here's why it doesn't matter. So the affirmative now just can't be like, here's our road to victory. We're going to win because now they're going to be like, the negative said this and we want to make sure that you understand. No, we win. So it puts you in the debate even when you're not speaking. That is key. Um, the two and R is about closing doors and making risky choices. They're less risky the more that you do your pre-round prep and you map out your two and R's before the round, but it's about creating that kind of sixth sense of what do you think the two AR is gonna go for? What are they winning? What are you losing? And how do you prioritize that on the flow in the two and R? Really good two and R's are the ones who know how to admit what they're losing and what they're really winning, what the affirmative is really winning and what they're really losing and knowing how to web that out. That is the beauty of a great two and R. Um, three is organizing the debate into simple categories and fitting aft responses uh, that are big threats uh, in to help them. This is going to help think through, um, this is going to help think through the line by line because a lot of the times what happens is that people are just going down the flow. I'm gonna answer this, I'm gonna answer this, I'm gonna answer this, I'm gonna answer this, but you're losing your argument when you do that. Is organize the F responses that you think are the highest threat to you winning your argument, right? Um, you don't have to answer everything if it doesn't matter for your the argument that you're going for. Or say, these arguments that the affirmative said don't matter, group them, here's why, and then get to the things that do matter that affect your ability to win um, the debate that you're having. Um, the last is that the RFD should not be surprising. You should have essentially written the RFD for the judge for a negative ballot. Your, your two and R is that. Here is the most important offense. Even if they win this, it doesn't matter. Da, 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 da. So if the judge agrees with you, right, they will read back your two, like they will read back essentially your two and R as the RFD. That's when you know you have found your money spot being a negative and you've developed that sixth sense because you are getting a better sense of what are you predicting the two AR but also creating different types of negative strategies that respond to the different two ARs or forcing the affirmative to have to go for a certain argument that you've already prepared to win. And with that being said, I have an assignment um, that I would love folks to try out, is map out three different two and ARs and explain one, why they are different, um, two, what the negative can lose, and the AF can win in these versions. And the better you get at ideological mapping, the more seamless your two and R's become. So please write this down. I would love uh, for this to be something that we can discuss at the beginning of our practice next week before jumping into the AF side of the critique. Um, but the more you map out, the more you really just sit down and think about your arguments, um, this will be helpful. And to be honest, this probably will be a lot more helpful too when we do the AF side, because you'll hear more about what is the AF going to say in response. So like, what does that mean in terms of when you're going for framework or when you're going for the alternative or when you're going for an impact term? Like, what are, what are these things? And so um, definitely try this out. Uh, if you're like, I want to really get some practice in, I highly suggest watching some um, strained college debates. 